me introduce Christian Sorace, and this is our fourth talk in the East Con speaker series. So Christian Sorace is a professor of uh, political science at Colorado College, and uh, he, he works in the intersection of uh, comparative politics and political theory. His uh, first book is uh, Shaken Authority, China's Communist Party, and the 2008 Shikuan Earthquake. Is the Sichuan Earthquake. And uh, he's also the editor of a volume whose title is uh, Afterlife of uh, Chinese Communism Political Concept from Mao to Xi. And uh, now is uh, working on a new project that focuses on the interlocking crisis of the democracy, capitalism, air pollution, and urbanization and, uh, in Mongolia. And uh, today is uh, giving the fork whose title is uh, Step Immunity. I forgot to say that uh, uh, Professor Sorace just got an offer from Cambridge University and uh, he will join the UK, the UK, Cambridge University in December. <laughs> Thank you for the uh, lovely introduction and invitation. Okay, I'll just jump right into it. In their recent, like, very recent book, uh, What Kind of World Is This? Judith Butler puts forward a powerful reading of the pandemic. Although we find ourselves in a quote, common immunological predicament, the common has not been achieved, end quote. Etienne Balabar makes a similar argument that the pandemic has quote, materially unified the human species in a passive manner, but in a way that the process of unification is also a process of radical divisions, end quote. Our objective being in common has not resulted in shared solidarities or, quote, acting in common, end quote, but a proliferation of divisions, private immunities, and apartheids. We are breathing together, but living apart. We are living in what Benjamin Bratton describes as a, quote, immunological commons, end quote, amidst the, quote, artificial segmentation of the human population into discrete tracts of the planet's surface, end quote, that we call nations. All of these theories in their own way articulate a version of the claim that during the pandemic, our immunological condition makes explicit a form of being in common, which however we have responded to by enclosing ourselves in immunological shelters that are often decorated with kitschy flags. The problem is that these immunological shelters no longer protect us if they ever did. Nation states cannot immunize us from the effects of climate change and from the corona uh, virus. As Peter Sloterdijk mordantly puts it, the reason of nations extends no further than preserving jobs on the Titanic. End quote. The concept of immunological monads is an outdated one, a product of its emergence in the age of the Cold War, as Donna Haraway has shown. The field of immunological research and feminist studies in science and technology have moved beyond that model of the insular self in a hostile environment, including Rosie Brediati's conceptualization of the placenta, Alfred Tober's cooperative Holobionts, and many others. From these innovations in our understanding of how the immune system works, as Haraway puts it, quote, a radical conception of connection emerges unexpectedly at the core of the defendant self, end quote. But as we also know, immunity is not limited to the biomedical field, which is a rather recent invention I mean, within the last 100 years or so, but is a word with a complex genealogy intertwining politics, law, and identity. Notably in this regard is Roberto Esposito's genealogy of the Latin word immunitas, which he defines as a mode of privilege and exemption from obligations, which results in the nullification of community. Esposito work, Esposito's work seems to have come into its own during the pandemic. People are desperately searching to immunize themselves 
by withdrawing from the contagion of our being in common. The lexical slippages and overlaps he traces between the biomedical and juridical have become the stuff of everyday language. Immune discourse has become common sense, but in some ways as common sense that makes our immunological condition even more bewildering and opaque. What is needed now, I am suggesting in this talk, is a genealogy of immunity as a political concept, but one that departs from espositos in both its location of origin, conceptualization, and destination. I'm not sure I'll be able to get to the destination part in the talk, but I'd be happy to point at it and discuss it in the Q&A. The origin I have in mind is the step of the medieval Mongol Empire. So I guess that's kind of, besides the title, it's kind of an unpredictable turn after how I just set up this talk. Um, whereas Esposito begins and ends his genealogy of immunitas in Europe, there is an entire history, as Aisha Zarakol reminds us, of political concepts and international relations beyond Europe's borders. In the Mongol Empire, and even predating it through within Central Asian history, the term darkla is nearly identical to the Latin term immunitas. And today, like immunity, darakla is the Mongolian word for both biomedical immunity and, as we will see, is central to discourses of national identity, extinction, and survival. So what I want to do for the rest of the talk is to offer my own genealogical overview of this concept of darakla. First, though, I need to make a few preliminary remarks on comparing um, on, on the relationship between Darakla and Immunitas. There are two working theories that I've come up with um, in terms of the relationship between the two, either cultural diffusion or the internal logic argument. Either the term circulated during encounters between the central Eurasian steppe empires and European states somewhere around the Hungarian plain, or the terms developed independently each other, of each other, something along the model of convergent evolution borrowed from evolutionary biology. Well, I don't have time to get into it here. I'm definitely in the camp of the latter, mainly because one of the arguments I'm going to put forward is that the, that so the architecture of sovereignty actually requires immunity as part of its internal logic. Um, and, and camp might be a bit misleading as no one's actually having this debate. Like people aren't talking to each other. The medieval Mongol historians aren't talking to the ancient Rome historians. You know, it's just kind of separate discourses. And throughout each, I can't find, you know, any um, account of cultural diffusion. Um, but, it, but it's a possibility. So at least I wanted to put it out there. But um, okay. second, one of the limitations of Esposito's theory of immunitas is that he doesn't really have a conception of sovereignty. And as I just stated, immunity is impossible without sovereignty. And part of this talk hopefully will make this point clear. In the context of the Mongol Empire, Darakla was a sovereign prerogative and technology of rule. Only the Han had the authority to grant immune status and the authority to revoke it. Although the status was heritable, it was not passed on in perpetuity and required periodic renewal through requests and court rituals. When a new Han ascended the throne, immunity had to be reapplied for. To put it differently, one's immunity did not outlive the life of the sovereign who granted it. And one of the problems with Esposito's theory is that he often speaks of immunitas as if it were a given status without analyzing the politics of who gave it. Darhan's status, similar to immunitas, granted privileges and exceptions from taxation, corvée labor, and other obligations and modes of service to the, to the sovereign. Um, however, and this is a tremendously important point of differentiation, Darhan's status was a mode of inclusion in the empire, rather than, as Esposito suggests in the context of ancient Rome, a withdrawal and negation from uh, obligation to community. Immunity was bestowed only when it benefited the needs of the empire, and it was deployed across roughly three heuristic categories, political economy, religious tolerance, and reward. But what did immunity then look like in practice? First, political economy, which is somewhat of a superfluous term in the Mongolian language, because the word for economy, edin zasek, already means the, the, the governance and administration of things. So the term economy has a political economy built into it. Um, 
Immunity was part of the state's classificatory system for the transfer of wealth, labor, and technology. As the historian Christopher Atwood put it uh, in a private correspondence with me, quote, things that belong to disfavored groups are vulnerable to seizure, while those belonging to the immune groups are not, end quote. But immunity was also more refined than the division of the subject slash object of plunder. Immune status was selectively granted to different professions whose services were needed by the empire. When the Mongols captured a new city, they would first sort out and spare the lives of the artisans, who would then be relocated to fill production needs throughout the empire. The role of blacksmiths was particularly important for war making and transportation. The reverence for blacksmiths can be seen in the fact that the Mongol word for blacksmith, darhan, is the same word for immune, which also has the connotation of the sacred. Blacksmiths were to be undisturbed and protected from, as Pamela Crossley puts it, quote, requisitions levied incessantly by passing imperial envoys, end quote. Immune charters, or yarlak, were also granted to religious institutions throughout the empire. In one of the most famous examples whose repercussions can still be felt today, Chinggis Khan conferred Darkhan status on Buddhist clerics, which allowed them to recruit and gather monks under their protection and enabled monasteries to accumulate vast amounts of wealth. The Golden Horde, or the Jochidols, whose rule encompassed vital trade networks from Siberia to Eastern Europe, granted the Russian Orthodox Church such a charter, exempting it from census taking, taxation, military conscription, and land seizure. While I am not an expert on Russian history, it is widely believed that this charter shifted the local balance of power, loosening the Orthodox Church's dependence on the patronage of local princes. Decades later, Azbek Han rewarded someone named Ivan I, the Grand Duke of Moscow, with immunity for quelling the rebellion in the city of Tiver. By extension, Moscow was bestowed immunity and granted authority for tax collection over other Russian principalities. Moscow's immunity lasted until it was revoked as a punishment for the Battle of Kulikovo in 1380, which many historians posit as the emergence of the concept of a shared Russian identity. In these cases, immunity was a mode of religious tolerance and incorporation into the body politic of the empire. The Mongols were happy enough to grant immunity to different religious institutions so long as all of them prayed in their own language to quote, God and heaven for the life of them. Uh, immunity was also granted as a reward for exceptional service. Most famous is the um, example of the commoners Badai and Kisilik who were rewarded immune status in exchange for warning Chinggis Khan of an attempt on his life. The secret history of the Mongols describes it as a quote, uh, you know, ventriloquized, ventriloquizing Genghis Khan, quote, a service that arrived between my life and my death, end quote. And it's really important, even though some of the translations translate this immune status with the word free man, that the term free man is actually extraordinarily misleading, because this did not grant a kind of emancipation or freedom, but it granted a set of privileges such as being permitted to carry quivers, to participate in formal dinners, and to have a kind of close access and proximity to the Han and to his court, right? So to be immune did not mean to be free from sovereignty, as this faucet somewhat insinuates, but to stand in a different relationship to it. Conversely, a situation in, uh, in, in medieval uh, Mongol Empire a uh, situation without a master, as in Guaybatov, is the Mongolian word for anarchy. So the, the Mongolian translation of the word for anarchy means to be masterless, which I think is an interesting um, uh, yeah, word for that. Um, okay, so to summarize the argument so far, immunity is an act of sovereignty, a status, with, a status granted, which granted its recipients privileges, and exemptions from obligations. It facilitated the consolidation of empire through its partitioning into hierarchies of statuses. Whereas for esposito, immunitas is a quote, privative category, end quote, that places a person outside of the community 
from where they, quote, owe nothing to anyone, end quote. Darakla does not create an outside, but is entirely interior to the ambit of sovereignty. And I also want to suggest, um, but I'm not a scholar of ancient Rome, but I get the sense from the little I do know as well that, that, that Esposito is really giving a very, very narrow reading of the Unitas that also misses some of the complexities um, um, in the context of which he's deriving it from. Um, but I, but uh, you know, that's not the, the grounds on which I'm making this particular argument. Point is, is that immunity is impossible outside of the body of the sovereign. So immunity belongs to the, to the sovereign body. The definition of immunity as privilege and exemption continued into the 20th century, but in a way that is normatively inverted. During the 70 year history of the Mongolian People's Republic, which lasted from 1924 until roughly 1992, it's also really important, we kind of often forget this, but Mongolia was the second socialist state and socialist republic to be established after the Soviet Union. In socialist discourse, class enemies and the feudal aristocracy were described as an erzin darhan, which although translated, at, which the term is translated into privileged aristocratic class, literally means an immune organ. Erzin or organ is a very complicated word which means authority, power, and right, but also means biological organ. So in Mongolian, the words, the same word is used to, to talk about vocal organs, sexual organs. So it's also a part of the body as well as a part of the states. The word means both of those things at the same time. And then to add darkhan, so the organ itself has it kind of, it's like part, it's like a, the, the, the organ itself is immunized. Um, and in this context, Darkla becomes privative and becomes used as an accusation of a failure to contribute to collectivity. And this gestures at the latent possibility I'd like to take up in the conclusion, if I have time, of communism being a redistribution or rather reconfiguration of immunities. But for now, I want to trace how the logic and meaning of immunity change with the advent of the nation state form. Um, Elite reformers, uh, Mongolian reformers in the late Qing period and democratic reformers a century later at the end of the socialist period struggled for independent statehood to carve out a sovereign territory for Mongolian identity. Let me just mention in passing that at the end of the Qing dynasty, the idea of Mongolian nationhood as a shared category of identity was relatively new and emergent. Historically, aristocrats and commoners existed according to different political categories. The aristocracy had genealogy, commoners did not. They were not of the same blood and bone as the Mongolians call it, descent groups. So the formation of the nation was at the very least in principle, a kind of horizontalization of immune privileges through the category of the citizen. What I'm suggesting, however, is that the nation state, um, the nation state form should be thought of as an immune dispositive under which immunity produces identity. The immune privileges of the aristocracy were not in reality transferred to the people, but to the body of the nation. We can see evidence of this in how the nation is described in the phrase of mana os, uh, oh, I can't read my own here. Uh, oh, mana os in darakladhil, which is translated as the sacred border of our nation, but also carries the connotation of an immunitary border. The first three lines, uh, the first line of three different versions of Mongolia's national anthem, which spans both the socialist and post-socialist periods, begins with this word, darhan, meaning now sacred as well as immune. It is also worth mentioning that to sacralize and to immunize are both processes of placing something out of reach, which implies that democratization is always a kind of profanation, uh, profanation and degradation. In practical terms, the nation is what deserves protection and devotion. Under the sovereignty of the nation state, Darakla has assumed the meaning of identity. I will come back to the Mongolian context, but first I want to sketch out the philosophical logic of the argument here by way of a detour through Peter Sloterdijk's conceptualization of immunity. For Sloterdijk, all identity is immunological. Group identities are ultimately nothing more than 
practices, forms, and responses to what Sloterdijk calls embodied expectations of injury, end quote. So the differentiation of identity as such is an immunological operation. Identity, like immunity, is the construction of a shelter in the vast, indifferent universe. For Sloterdijk, then, nation states are in the end complex immunological apparatuses, which organize identity at complex scales. To walk through the argument, I want to look at the term separately as different layers of the same apparatus. The nation state, and I, I try to make this as clear as possible, the nation state does not protect some pre-existent identity. It offers the protection of identity. The coming of the nation is, as Sloterdijk puts it, quote, the equation of the nation with the ultimate political unit of survival, end quote. People are willing to die for their nation as if their lives depended on it. And this was the problem of World War I that baffled Lenin and was later taken up by Gramsci, of why would the proletariat die for their identifications with the national bourgeoisie? And I'm suggesting that Sloterdijk might provide an answer here by thinking of the nation as an immunological operation. Okay, that sounds super abstract. So I wanna take it down a little bit from the abstraction into, into the poetic. A less abstract version of this idea can be found in the poetry of Dejima Galsensuk, one of Mongolia's most famous living poets, who is also a member of far-right political organizations. And one of his most frequently cited and celebrated lines is, quote, when Mongolian radio greets in Chinese, I will die, end quote. So what is he saying here in this kind of hyperbolic line? He's saying that his own life depends on the nation's immunity, the nation's immune apparatus, even as he senses that it is compromised, failing, and in need of repair. Gelsensuk's poem is a feeling and sounding out of Sloterdijk's conceptualization of the nation as a, quote, imaginary and real immune structure that could be experienced as a convergence of place and self, end quote. Now, note how Sloterdijk's cultural constructivist account of identity is quite compatible with, or at least doesn't stand in the way of, the assertions of cultural distinctiveness and separateness found in the programs of many far-right European political parties. It is not surprising, actually, that certain leaders of the AFD were students of Sloterdijk. Cultural immunity provides the philosophical architecture to what Enzo Traverso has described of as a tendency in Europe of, quote, almost the whole right has now reformulated the nation in terms of identity, end quote. This is also the case in Mongolia, but where national independence and statehood and identity are understood as providing immunity from the neocolonial desires ascribed to Mongolia's neighbors of China and Russia. In 2013, the writer Indra published an essay, the Dar Klatayo, which literally means, are we immune? Um, but can also be translated as I've been arguing so far, who are we? would be an equally valid translation. Are we immune slash who are we? And in this essay, she writes that Mongolian's nomadic lifestyle offers cultural immunity from assimilation. And again, the word here for immunity um, could also be identity and for assimilation, she, that literally means to, to be dissolved, um, to dissolve. So the essay answers its own question by differentiating Mongolia's nomadic civilization, cultural identity from a sedentary Han Chinese one. Cultural traditions and practices are immune repertoires. On social media, if you do a Google search of this word that I'm talking about, not Google search, search on Twitter before Elon Musk sinks it, Darakla um, uh, will come up over and over again in addition to the biomedical, like, you know, get your boosters, we need to, you know, for COVID and be immune. The word Darakla comes up again and again as referenced with cultural practices. Uh, immunity is boosted through playing the horse head fiddle, eating traditional Mongolian food such as dried cheese curds, uh, maintaining linkages to pastoralism in the countryside, and most vitally speaking, Mongolian keeping connection to the mother tongue. 
Interestingly, Mongolians herders uh, believe that the bacteria found in dairy products, such as milk, yogurt, and dried cheese curds, and fermented horse milk, provide both physical as well as cultural immunity. So when you're drinking pumas, right, or adder, you're actually protecting yourself against colds, and you're simultaneously reenacting like what it means to be Mongolian. So, so your oper- so immunity is operating on both of those levels. So one of the most immediate and obvious consequences of this conception of immunity is that what is foreign appears as threatening. Foreign influences weaken the, the, the Mongolia's immunity slash identity. In, an, in a recent poem uh, by Galson Suk titled How the Nomads Were Tamed, he depicts a China that relies on soft power and cultural pacification to, de- to defeat the Mongolians. And the implication is that they, they couldn't military, you know, the, 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 the politics of this dichotomy of like Mongolian traditional nomadic virility versus a kind of like effeminate mode of, 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 of uh, China that my friend Frank Belay has written about his book, Sinology, is kind of the backdrop of this, this poem. So the idea is that, that the Mongolians, even though a small nation of three point two or three million people still could not be militarily defeated. But so they have to be defeated through cultural pacification. And uh, Chinese invite the nomads to come down from their horses, gorge themselves on mantel and liquor and forget their latent ferocity. For the nomads, the only immunity against becoming Chinese is to revive Mongolian cultural traditions and practices. But as the poet also seems to suggest, culture cannot on its own withstand the appeal, accessibility, and diffusion of global media. Yeah, I mean, I've met him, I've interviewed him in Ulaanbaatar, and he usually wears a Nirvana t-shirt, so whatever. Um, But for Mongolian cultural identity to survive requires a strong, you know, postmodern times, right? Requires a strong, if not authoritarian state. this This is ultimately a defense of authoritarian state apparatus, right? Because the state then in this conception is a second layer of defense of immunity, which goes beyond the mere function of border security and national security, but also touches on the state's role as the provider of welfare and guarantor of identity through its official seal, symbols, rituals, rhetoric, and aesthetics. And we can see the mundane functioning of this logic in a speech on language education policy delivered in 2018 by then Mongolian president Hatamagin Batuluk. And in the speech, Batuluk describes, yeah, the, the speech on language policy is all about the weakened immunity of the Mongolian language and how it impacts the immunity of the national body. And he sets out the state's role to, quote, defend the immunity of the Mongolian identity. And the state is a, quote, vital immunity for the existence of the Mongolian <coughs> These peculiar figures of speech, such as vital immunity and the need to defend immunity, only make sense, I want to argue, through the semantic linkage of immunity and identity. Um, I want to, just to save time, um, rather than reading from some of these sections, I'll I'll, I'll just summarize them very quick and kind of move towards the end. Uh, Almost at the end of the talk. Um, But... um, then there's obviously a huge anti-communist discourse that is linked with this immunological discourse. And I quote from a 2014 essay by the historian Bat Sahin, who argues that the Mongolian nation is now almost incapable of defending itself. Its its immunity has been wrecked. And um, the reason for that is its history as the history of state socialism. Um, He writes that the ideology of socialism, quote, was like, you know, a a pathogen that invaded Mongolia in the early 20th century, and that the effects of socialist ideology continued to wreak havoc on the immune system of future generations. For Batsahin, class struggle undermined national unity by cleaving the nation into two. And I want to say, of course, on this point, any good communist would not disagree, right? But But rather than decrying, would embrace the antagonism. Um, for Bat Sahin, however, the anniversary of the October Revolution is a day we have no reason to celebrate. Instead, the October Revolution is regarded as an interruption of the continuity of national history, and so on. And um, I'm going to skip over this part and just get to the conclusion to save time. Um, but I look at some of the uh, populist uh, discourse in Mongolia right now that also is using this language of immunity and for, uh, from the perspective of nationalists, right? What weakens the immune system of the nation is a relentless process of fragmentation into private interests. 
And Sloterdijk describes people who, quote, largely abandon solidarity with the fates of their political commune, end quote, in search of private immunities. On the one hand, there is an elite withdrawal from a common fate or shared condition, whether through the privatization of public services, tax exemptions, or the fantasies of elite exodus and colonization of Mars. And under global capitalism, immunity, that the sovereignty shifts from the, from the political sovereign to the sovereignty of money which grants immunity. Individual immune strategies are both transnational evasions and internal perforations of the nation state cont container. Um, and then there's also a critique of um, the kind of immune strategies among the impoverished uh, and labor, the, the critique of labor migration, which also is, is viewed as uh, to Korea and to the US as undermining national immunity. And in 2016, I actually conducted an interview with one of Mongolia's most famous uh, gangster rappers um, and um, uh, on urban redevelopment. And it was only later when I'm looking back at the transcript of this interview um, that I found this incredible sentence where he writes, or where he said, the loss of workers uh, going overseas weakens the immune system of the nation because it eviscerates the tax base, right? So again, this, this concept of immunity is used to both critique um, uh, the uh, uh, corrupt elites uh, for evading taxes and sending their kids to school overseas, as well as to, you know, critique um, people engaged in survival strategies through labor migration. All of it kind of fragments this idea of the nation. And then there's a whole other discourse of democratic immunity, democratic death uh, that, that I'm just going to skip over. I'm happy to talk about it in the Q&A. Okay, to conclude. Where does this leave us? I would like to return to Sloterdijk, who argues that these immune strategies have run their course and have exhausted themselves. The immunological justification of the nation state is incoherent in the midst of a global pan pandemic and planetary heating. As Sloterdijk puts it, quote, in this crisis, one can already see that there is no real private property of immunity advantages. The virus ignores national borders, fences, and walls, end quote. An obvious point, but interesting to see Sloterdijk also changing his own thinking on these issues. The previous but still prevailing logic of immunity is not only dysfunctional, it is dangerous and even suicidal. For Sloterdijk, it is necessary to invent an entirely unprecedented mode of, end quote, immunitary reason, end quote, which he calls the imperative of co-immunism that would be adequate to the scale of the global crises we face today. So he says basically this co-immunism, we need to think about a protectionism of the whole rather than if we continue to think of protection of the self or nation in these binaries, it will be ultimately self-defeating. Um, the situation is not one that we have chosen but is the exigency to which we must respond. And Sloterdijk begrudgingly admits that we have been transformed into, to return to the introduction of the talk, quote, bio-communists against our will, a shared condition of being in common that we have not yet actually um, articulated in our practices and strategies of solidarity. Sloterdijk goes to tremendous lengths to distance himself from the legacies of 20th century communism, which he asserts through the separating hyphen and neologism of co-immunism. And there's a rather comical exchange between Sloterdijk and Zizek in a joint interview where Zizek quips that he wants nothing to do with Sloterdijk's hyphen, and Sloterdijk responds that he wants nothing to do with Zizek's communism. I will not comment here on Zizek's communism, but all joking aside, uh, in the next chapter and part of the book manuscript I'm working on, I want to take Sloterdijk to task and argue that his anti-communism cuts him off from one of the most powerful critical traditions that has attempted to dismantle the immune privileges which constitute the identities of the modern world. And the lesson I draw from tracing this genealogy of Darakla from Mongol Empire to the Mongolian nation state is that a new dispensation of immunity will require a reimagining 
and reformatting of sovereignty. fascinated. Uh, I'm a historian of early modern China and uh, also trained in history of science. So you can see how this really, you know, light on a lot of things in my head. Um, <clears throat> so um, I never thought about immunity as a political concept, actually. So, uh, 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 so the way that you draw the parallels between immunity as a as a political concept, and the immunity as a, a biomedical idea is very interesting. Mm -hmm. um, so let me talk about, and the way you open your talk sort of begs the question of how this two transformation mm -hmm. can be influenced from each other, right? Mm -hmm. um, so if we only talk about immunity as a medical biological idea, mm -hmm. that uh, almost all medical traditions across Eurasia didn't have the idea of a germ theory mm -hmm. until 19th century. Mm -hmm. So from East Asian traditions or Galenic, Aristotelian mm -hmm. traditions, nobody would assume that when you get sick, mm -hmm. you were invaded by a foreign agent. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and it seems like the modern medical idea of immunity presupposes mm -hmm. this germ theory, right? Mm -hmm. um, but, but immunity as a political idea, mm -hmm. does it have that? Did it have that in ancient Roman times or in 13th mm -hmm. century across the entire Mongolian Empire? Mm -hmm. uh, I'm pretty sure it does not exist mm -hmm. in this Asian tradition. So um, it would be interesting to see how this parallel continue to interact mm. with each other. Mm. And a, sort of a side question for this is that in East Asia, right, when they experienced the traumatic transition to modernity, um, both uh, Japanese, Koreans, and Chinese, they all struggle with the terminology. Mm -hmm. modern scientific terminology, right? Mm -hmm. So they have to invent a lot of terms. Mm -hmm. Japan did it first, and basically Chinese and Korean copy those mm -hmm. modernization of terms, including a lot of medical terms, even the terms like the literature, mm -hmm. philosophy, exactly. sociology, yeah, economy, those terms are all mm -hmm. uh, invented by neologists. So, so the, the 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 Mongolian term darka is that how I say it? Darka. Uh, yeah. Did it also go through similar transformation like other Right. So th there are. Um, th thank you. Those are uh, excellent points. And, and and first, I want to say that I think what you're naming is a problem I see in Esposito's work. Okay. That it's very difficult to keep all of mm -hmm. the strands together and rather than dropping one, focusing focusing on one and dropping all of the others, right? And I think that Esposito in the beginning kind of brings up this idea of the exemption and then really leaves it behind to look at other things in much uh, you know, greater detail. So I'm trying hopefully not to, to do that and to think about these multiple dimensions together. But no, I mean, you're... You're absolutely right that that is um, that that can, that comes through this dark lab meeting biomedical immunity is is um, through um, mainly uh, uh, Soviet uh, 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 dictionaries and then translated. You know, I, I I'm trying to find how the decision was made to translate the biomedical why dark lab was used at the as the term, but it's been very difficult so far. Um, but the, the early, what's really interesting is what I have found is late 19th, early 20th century um, discussions 
in Mongolia of smallpox um, use a different terminology, which is just fascinating to me, um, uh, that when uh, to go to uh, the, the, uh, the, the main Qing court for investiture ceremonies, yeah. they were only permitted if they already had smallpox. Um, because then it was, you know, viewed to have some immunity. But the, the word that was used in Mongolian was they had a cooked body versus a raw body. They actually said, so if you didn't have smallpox, you still had a raw body. And then the other term they used was like white body, because white meant holy and uncontaminated and kind of pure. So, so those kind of cultural categories were actually like working out some immunological theory, right, uh, at, 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 that, at that time. But that's late 19th century, right? Yeah. using this raw cooked kind of distinction that I find fascinating. Um, but yeah, so, so the Soviets, the, the Darakla mode comes specifically through the like Soviet um, tutelage of, 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 of like trying to impose like a very kind of like hygienic, moder like modernizing hygienic regime with those kinds of concepts. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, so, so, so with the wager, I think that Esposito, and I'm trying also to do in my own way, is, is that um, even though there are different kind of strands of theory, um, they overlap in potentially productive ways of thinking of the political category of exemption and then thinking of the bio biomedical understanding of immunity as a mode of protection um, are ways of imagining our relationships with each other through these kinds of separations and statuses, as well as spatial organizations, right? And so part of what I'm trying to do is, is, is think through how that kind of leads us to the present and how we view and relate to each other. Thank you. Max, can I follow up with a few comments? Yes. Yeah, because, you know, what you just, the, the smallpox example mm -hmm. was fascinating. Mm -hmm. um, ever since the 18th century, that uh, most people from most Mongolians and Tibetans knew for a fact that if you go to a high population density place like in China, mm -hmm. uh, you will get smallpox and die. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's well known for those people, right? Mm -hmm. And in fact, uh, the Chenoa Emperor in 1790s, invited then a very young Dalai Lama mm -hmm. from Tibet to China to celebrate mm -hmm. his birthday. Dalai Lama back then was in his 30s, very strong, very yeah. young. And the moment he reached Beijing, he got smallpox and died. Mm -hmm. um, that was a very much a disappointment for the emperor mm -hmm. at that time. And of course, you know, right after Dalai Lama's visit, uh, Paul McCartney from mm -hmm. UK visited China. So a lot of people don't think about these two mm -hmm. things as sort of a sequential events and mm -hmm. how the emperor dismissed mm -hmm. the British, British diplomat, but viewed Dalai Lama's visit as the most important state ceremony. Mm -hmm. And they have the language mm -hmm. models for smallpox and how they can, well, they, they have no idea how you know, people got smallpox and die, right? They just know the symptoms of it. Mm -hmm. And uh, that language, even knowledgeable language, is very interesting. Right. right. That if you if you had it and survived it, then mm -hmm. that was the equivalent of some functional immunity that would permit Mongolians to visit the court in Beijing. Exactly. Yeah, it's really interesting. Hi, thank you. Uh, thank you so much for the, the talk. Um, I'm uh, Agatha Kamaliska. I'm a uh, visiting pre-doc. Um, and my interest is in um, spaces of um, human, non-human conflicts. So what I'm really interested in, uh, what you were talking about, is the, 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 the use of the term um, immunity seems really counter, and it kind of relates to your question, uh, counterintuitive because it seems like immunity is this kind of hygienic separation mm -hmm. whereas the, at least the way i understand immunity it's exactly from that you know living in a big city in a big um crowded space where there is a lot of mm -hmm. exchange of uh bugs and, <laughs> and bacteria right. and viruses and stuff like that so um how 
um, hmm. how does that kind of, um, uh, yeah, how does that, these two different meanings work in your understanding hmm. of, of immunity? That, that, that actually, you would have, in order to mm -hmm. gain immunity, you would have to have these international contracts. Right. Otherwise, you can only be like sterile, right. like hygienically ster mm -hmm. sterilized in a, in a bubble. Right. Well, that's what I, 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 you know, I've actually found it very refreshing. And even though it's not in this talk, I have ventured out and read some of the kind of actual, you know, philosophies of, of the, the science of, immuno of immunology and how it's developed. All so many of those issues and categories of like, you know, are, are, are thinking about exposure and thinking, you know, about tolerance and those kinds of terms. And let's say the transplant, um, uh, the, as, as Brady Adi and, uh, talks uh, about the kind of, uh, also the, the fetus and the placenta as being uh, really strange immunological objects mm -hmm. and, and the question of why the mother's body doesn't actually attack the fetus. If you, going back to that 20th century model of the immune system as just the defense of the host organism against which it is perceived to be foreign, right? And that model has been left behind. It's both still operative but also has been left behind in many ways and so these kinds of complicated um questions about you know from the uh transplant uh, um transfusions pregnancy all right we started to change i guess when this around the 70s uh, thinking about immunity as a much more complex kind of relationship um, rather than this bound itself, right? Mm -hmm. So so I'm also trying to, to work, I, I also want to work past that model and think about, you know, that, that, that shared, like, um, if, we, if we think, let me, let me put it this way, if we think about COVID right now, that's part of the argument that, you know, with the, the um, vaccine apartheid or the kind of exclusions of who has access first to vaccines. Um, we can buy ourselves the short term immunity, but as long as the, 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 the virus uh, mutates and proliferates through unvaccinated populations and bodies, it might always kind of outstrip our own like immunities, right? So I mean, you know, the old kind of communist way of thinking of like, if one is not free, we're all mm -hmm. not free. I think you could apply that to a kind of immunological mm -hmm. like model. If it's not a kind of collective mode of a shared immunity, then that uh, that way of thinking of just protecting yourself mm -hmm. actually doesn't really even work mm -hmm. for the science, yeah. right? And now I'm trying to think through what it would mean to articulate that mm -hmm. in terms of thinking about the politics, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but so your, your hands. I was just going to add because then you have herd immunity, right? If mm -hmm. enough people had it, mm -hmm. they protect the ones who would be still vulnerable because the disease wouldn't trans right. transmit. Yeah, I, I don't, I, to my knowledge, I think, does anybody make the herd immunity argument now? Like in terms of... Like, with COVID, with COVID yeah. I don't know, but I think with right. a lot of diseases, it's... it's, yeah. it's right. I just saw, met somebody from Hong Kong this weekend who says, not publicized, but everybody got uh, the uh, Omicron virus in mm. terms of the population, and they now have herd immunity in Hong Kong. Because I know that was like Sweden, right? Sweden's kind of strategy in the beginning was as minimal amount of governmental regulation, because the belief was that it would it would it would circulate and immunize the population in, in, in that in that way. Um, but you know, uh, yeah. This, uh, but uh, these are. Uh, the, the, also, the, 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 these are really uh, fascinating and, and very helpful questions. So I'm, I'm getting, what I'm hearing here is also really thinking a lot about the, the conjuncture of these different kinds of uh, threads. Okay, we have a four questions, maybe five. <laughs> 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 
Max P. Shaw Paul. <laughs> so basically, everybody, almost everybody. Um, thank you, uh, thank you for the talk, and I uh, I love the title. So I hope you uh, stick with that title in various ways. Um, I have two questions regarding the medieval Mongol Empire. Um, the first has to do with uh, where the category of darhan was applied. So you mentioned subject populations, specifically artisans and blacksmiths, being transported back. Uh, you know, uh, to the capital uh, to build things. Um, and I'm wondering about whether uh, Darhan also was applied to, say, uh, retinues, uh, say, also relationships uh, between Mongol tribes. How did it attach to uh, mm -hmm. Mongol populations and not just sub subject populations? Yeah. Well, so I, I guess that's my factual question. Mm -hmm. um, and then I guess my next question would be more of an invitation or um, an inquiry about. Uh, uh, whether the episode at Kaffa in say the third, what is it, the 1340s, uh, this, you know, sort of much debated episode where uh, the Mongols uh, were said, Mongol forces were said to have contracted bubonic plague, mm -hmm. and then they were um, supposedly, on certain accounts at least, uh, launching uh, plague ridden bodies over the wall mm -hmm. uh, of Kaffa in their siege. Um, I know that this is, this may be. A, a controversial episode in terms of uh, who believes what, um, you know, which historians believe what. Um, but how might that, or how might that not, uh, enter as an allegory into your work on immunity? Well, this, this is amazing. I, I, I'm going to have to think about. I, I don't have a good answer to the last question, um, but I, but I, but I'll definitely. Can consider it um, right. In, in, in terms of your your first uh, question, I think one of the interesting things, at least for me, is that the term isn't uh, an inscriptive one, right? Based on where uh, uh, the, the particular identity of like captive, enslaved subject versus uh, Mongol, but is one that is entirely based on the kind of exigency and, uh, and, 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 and interest and needs of the empire at any right given time. So two of the examples that I gave, uh, you know, you could see giving it to the Buddhist clerics, yeah, right? Uh, you yeah. could see giving it to merchants in Central Asia. Uh, you could see it's a governing technology, right? Um, and then one of the examples was the commoners who saved Chinggis Khan's life by warning him of this kind of uh, assassination attempt. Mm -hmm. So, at the, so their reward, you know, again, wasn't you know was specifically Darhan status in terms of these privileges to then be able to be close to Chinggis Khan because now they're also loyal and trustworthy too, right? Mm -hmm. To carry quiver, to carry quivers, and to do those kinds of things. So, so, so again, it would be. Um, well, one thing about the, the retinue that I find very interesting, and I still haven't really thought through yet, um, one of the word for the, uh, not bodyguards or heshif, but the kind of um, close uh, like komitas, right, of, of, of the Hans was nohor. The word nohor means husband mm. in Mongolian, but it was also the word that was translated for comrade that the mm. communists chose. So I I don't know what to do with any of that, you know. But so 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 the Han's like retinue, like royal were were nohor, which is the same word for husband as well as comrades. But so that's also just something uh, completely interesting. But yeah, so, so so one of the things that I find uh, just to, to 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 go back, and I know we have multiple questions, so just keep it very simple, but is that fact that it, it's really on the basis of the particular context rather than having anything to do with the kind of descriptive identity that might then claim a right to that status, right? And again, so the sovereign dies, you have to reapply for it with the new sovereign, or you have to, so it doesn't just extend, it, it's just, it's, it's tethered to that relationship rather than something that transcends it and then yeah. you know and you and and i'm looking forward to your later interpretation of kappa uh, when we next what, what, get to chat what, what, i'm sorry what's your name again uh steven steven okay yeah, yeah if i 
But if I, I, I have to, when I come up with something good, I'll email you. Great. <laughs> <laughs> Kristen, thank you. This was a really, really interesting talk. Um, and <laughs> I mean, you gave us a lot to think about and to think with. And um, I, I mean, I have a few things that I wanted to sort of raise. But I guess the, the main question for me is um, you, you, you rightly criticized Esposito, thank you, from the perspective of the way in which he theorizes or he likes theorizing the relationship between immunity mm -hmm. and sovereignty. Mm -hmm. And you offer us a different genealogy of immunity. But I wonder then, do we also need a different genealogy of sovereignty? Because mm -hmm. you are transposing us into a very different context mm -hmm. at a very different time. I mean, 14th century from then until, you know, socialist Mongolia and then today. So what does sovereignty mean in the Mongolian context of a kind of nomadic right. uh, existence, but then socialist iteration of that and then the contemporary movement? So uh, I wonder if we're still talking about the same um, governing concept and how then this new genealogy of immunity plays into that, um, uh, especially because I suppose maybe this is a defect of my training as a political theorist, but really sovereignty is so much associated with a kind of modern articulation in, in you know, in the Western tradition that then, um, like, like, how how can we conceptualize or like do we need different terms to think with when we talk about like the um, uh, Mongolian emperor's granting of privileges, um, what that rule entails or what that governing strategy entails. Mm -hmm. And then the, the other more minor question that I had was, you know, um, thinking about immunity perhaps uh, also through like the uh, Derridian approach to autoimmunity yeah. that uh, I'm sure we're well aware of that has been like an influential strand of this debate, especially after 9-11, sort of the, the pharmacon uh, idea. Is that something that you, you see um, in one way or another? I'm not necessarily suggesting in the same guise, but sort of like the incorporation of the of the other mm -hmm. in order to neutralize its impact, but also to boost um, one's own strength. Like, does that uh, factor in um, uh, in, the, in the Mongolian context? Yeah. Um, so, I mean, it's just uh, take whatever uh, you like, but thank you. Oh, no, I think <laughs> those are excellent questions and it's not, uh, I, I, it, it's definitely not a limitation of, of one of training in political theory. It's probably just my own messy, you know, my own just kind of messiness uh, as, as doing doing history outside of my own training. <laughs> um, but uh, I, I do. So I think one, you know, with the kind of internal logic debate, right? I was talking to a historian. Um, forgetting his name, uh, but of, of, of the late Roman Empire about how immunitas worked in those kinds of conditions and how different, uh, you know, not just Mongol Empire or Roman Empire, but all different kinds of polities at the time or, you know, over like all different kinds of polities throughout human history have some kind of immunity actually as the operative concept. Now, I can't back that statement up right now and I'm not, you know, that's not the kind of research I do to try to, but, but if that's true, I think that might be able to start to make a sketch of some logic of sovereignty where immunity is part of its kind of like internal architecture and how do I understand sovereignty in this concept, um, in, in this particular way, would be through this idea of who has the authority to, uh, who is authorized to grant 
um, you know, bestow as well as revoke and, and nullify these kinds of statuses and, and determinations. And so, you know, now I'm anxious because we have a historian of, uh, of, of, of early modern China here. Uh, but, you know, I've written before in the Chinese context, right, um, especially about the Communist Party's relationship to this word gratitude. And uh, the, the Chinese word for gratitude, like gan en, uh, is, is literally to feel the kindness, the grace, the benevolence of the sovereign, right? Like in that kind of history of late Qing, right? The sovereign can grant exceptions, can um, do all kinds of, to bestow titles, right? Has that kind of like ultimate, absolute authority, right? In the kind of naming and in the investiture. I still think that fundamental like apparatus of sovereignty doesn't really go away, right? It's gets complicated. Uh, uh, but but so uh, what? So what I'm trying to, to to suggest here maybe is that we can see something in the Mongol period that's not some like artifact of like pre-modern societies, but is actually. Um, I know I'm running the risk of sounding completely trans-historical now, and, 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 but I, I, you know, maybe I'll, I'll wager that risk um, of, of, of how sovereignty kind of operates by making those determinations and distinctions through the kind of, you know, authority of the voice of the sovereign, and then and the, the, on also the, the investiture. So, so, so. Um, I don't know if that's a, a satisfactory answer or or not, and then we'd, I'd have to kind of show the different ways in which we could uh, see that operative in our apparatuses of sovereignty today. Uh, but I, I don't think it would be hard to do that. I don't know. Is, this, is, is that helpful or not? No. For, um, uh, but uh, but so, so so it's 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 um, it's a way of. Uh, yeah, maybe a different kind of um, approach to, 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 to sovereignty. Um, but I don't want to particular, what I'm trying actually not to do is to particularize it as something like specifically East Asian or, and Mongolians also don't consider, yeah, the whole part of this talk was they want to carve <laughs> themselves out of the East Asian and they consider it, you know, uh, Eurasian or, or entirely different. Um, uh, uh, but nevertheless, I don't want to, to, to just kind of particularize it because I, I actually think that there's some broader uh, dynamic at play here. And then it varied, of course, I just, I think autoimmunity is such a tricky term. And then the more I read about the science, the more I think a lot of political theorists and philosophers really just completely misuse the term. But that's another, you know, that's another conversation. But yeah, the, there's a new book, uh, Mark Neocleus, uh, Neocleus, I can't, but who, who does a whole thing on immunity and security and argues basically kind of in this Deridian way that we've, we've entered into this state of autoimmunity where, you know, our, the apparatus is meant to defend us are, have turned against us and are, you know, and, and I think I like more kind of, uh, you know, Sloterdijk's idea, not that they're necessarily turning against us, but that they're ultimately ineffectual or inadequate to the actual crises and challenges that we face. And anyway, we can talk more about that later. Oh, I'm always happy. Talk about that. Uh, other. So, nice key, uh, My question is: uh, What if uh, we just oppose uh, historically and conceptually uh, to different ideas of immunity? Mm. So, on the one hand, the immunity that is uh, granted as a set of a uh, privilege. Mm -hmm. And they are on the other side, uh, uh, the immunity is positive of uh, the nation state. Mm -hmm. So the difference I see historically and conceptually mm -hmm. is uh, that uh, in the first, in the former case, in the, in the set of uh, privilege, what you have is uh, 
uh, let's say, a set of uh, particular liberties mm -hmm. which are always located in, especially in different contexts. And, uh, and then if you have a, if there's a kind of a whole that is a kind of a organized order of uh, privileges and mm -hmm. liberties and uh, immunitas plural. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, the nation, what the nation state does, and it does the same thing with the many different concepts. Basically, it just singularizes concepts. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we don't have a liberties plural, we have a freedom singular. Mm -hmm. We don't have uh, authorities or autoritates, we have a power singular, um, and we have uh, immunity singular. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And now immunity is organized around, I'm following what you mm -hmm. say, borders. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, uh, and what the borders define is uh, a very rigorous binary between mm -hmm. citizens right. and aliens. Right, yeah. inclusion, exclusion. Mm -hmm. So basically, the alien is always a potential mm -hmm. virus, something mm -hmm. that can attack mm -hmm. the safety mm -hmm. of the of the nation. Mm -hmm. It's also interesting that at a certain point, uh, Hobbes mm -hmm. translated "salus populi" with uh, people safety. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I don't think it's already medical and biological, but mm -hmm. it seems to be that uh, this is the direction mm -hmm. where the political categories mm -hmm. in modern Europe, this is the direction where these categories were going. Mm -hmm. So in a certain way, the, 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 the binary, the modern binary is much more dramatic right. than the nuances of uh, immunities, of plural mm -hmm. privileges and liberties that mm -hmm. we had before. Mm -hmm. One can even say that I uh, may be from the perspective of a, of a deported alien mm -hmm. or an immigrant in one of the boats in the Mediterranean, it's much better to live in a system of a privilege mm -hmm. than in the system of a alien citizen, of the alien citizen binary, mm -hmm. in which basically you are a virus that mm -hmm. is attacking the safety of the, of the, of the body politics of the, of the nation. So this is a, so as a, as a, as a, my first question comment is a, I think we should uh, historicize this uh, category right. in, 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 the, in a way that uh, basically we follow not only the concept of sovereignty, but a kind of a constellation of concepts, sovereignty, freedom, and, uh, and, uh, and immunit immunitas. They belong to the same constellation where they work together. And when you change one concept, the other concepts change mm, simultaneously. Yeah. Sec and the second layer of the question, and I don't have any answer because I don't know this, I don't know, I don't know history of the history of medicine. Uh, I can only know, uh, I only know that uh, virus and bacteria more or less were discovered in the 19th century. Mm -hmm. Right. And uh, right. simultaneously, in 19th century, at least in Europe, uh, there was a biologization, how do you call it, of a race. Mm -hmm. So race was, uh, not the Jews, for example, mm -hmm. were no longer right. just a Christian, a, a religious category. They became stuck to their biology. So mm -hmm. even the conversion cannot change a Jew. Mm -hmm. And that happened in the 19th century. Mm -hmm. That happened when virus and bacteria were discovered. Right. So and I, 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 I that, that yeah. is a long conversation. I no longer believe in the autonomy of science. I think a science mm -hmm. and, and political categories, they develop together. Right. And, and, and they are, in these two developments are in time. Yeah. And, and, and I think, so basically, you know, what, what is going on in the, in the 19th century as an episode of the nation state is that basically we are no longer talking about a kind of an internal disorder mm -hmm. that I think, again, I need a history mm -hmm. of medicine. I think this is uh, how sickness was understood mm -hmm. in the ancient times. Right. And now is uh, sickness is an attack mm -hmm. from outside. Right. Is a, is a, is a, medically is a virus, politically, is uh, the 
proletarians or the Jews who are no longer part of the nation. Right. You know, the, the, the entire 19th, 19th century was, a, was an attempt to define them as a no part, as, as, as a no longer part of the nation, as an external attack. Right. Yeah, right. No, no. I will say that I have to cut. Fair enough, fair enough. Sorry. Just, just, I wanted to think out loud with you. Caesar's not. Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> now, that's um, the first, I, I have to thank you. The first comment is, is so extraordinarily helpful because. That's what I have been, I, I'm kind of, uh, you, you put it a lot nicer than, than I did, right? I'm trying, I'm like in the broader chapter that I kind of chopped up to try to make presentable as a talk. I'm trying to like work out that shift in the logic of sovereignty through the nation state form and how it changes the logic of immunity, right, as, as well. And then the second part of your comment, layering in those shifts within the kind of scientific research and the historicization of those also terms. Um, so yeah, no, I, I completely, I like, I really love how you put it, of thinking of it as a constellation and when one term shifts, all of them kind of shift together. And, and I completely agree because I could also ask myself the question of why even make this long historical argument about the terms in the Mongol Empire, right? And to show, you know, not just as, you know, fun exercise, because I have to write something, um, but, <laughs> um, but, but ultimately, right, you know, uh, thinking about why do genealogy like this, it, it, it's showing a different mode in a different constellation, as you put it, a different regime of thinking about immunity, which opens up, right, that space of thinking about other possibilities of its kind of configuration. And I love that about the kind of much more flexible kind of pluralization of immunities, mm -hmm. where then the nation state really claims a kind of monopoly yeah. over. And that's where Sloterdijk is, 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 is saying in his own really ambivalent and also kind of messed up way, that he's basically saying the nation state claims that kind of um, you know, monopoly of immunity. And then now that's obviously under the significant stress in so many different ways. And you can see these kinds of reactions to it. And we need to think of a new logic that does not fall into the friend enemy yeah. dichotomization, that does not fall into the. And, and you know, to go back to the. I'm sorry, I forgot, I forgot your name. Okay. I got to, to go back to kind of your, your questions too, right? That the. the, the uh, the science of immunology has also really moved beyond that, right? And, and you know, I mean, I'm at, you know, history of consciousness, you know, famously, right, Donna Haraway's like Simeon Cyborg, right? That essay in that piece is really mapping how, right, like that way of thinking of immunology as the defense of the immune self uh, versus other uh, host versus foreign it really is, is, is ramified through kind of Cold War logic that, 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 that they're all in the mid 20th century, these different discourses are all kind of amplifying each other, right? The anti-communism also a motive virus, right? Uh, so the defense of the liberal self, the defense of the family, the defense of the nation, um, you know, at that same time in the Cold War is, is almost being supported by reference to the emerging science of immunology and thinking about the and then they're borrowing right that's why they're, they're borrowing from each other and then now that's kind of being left behind uh in multiple ways but so no i think you're right that to, to historicize especially thinking of uh racialization anti-communism 20th century Cold War logic, emergence of science of immunology, kind of this perfect cluster that then changes fundamentally how, you know, the self versus other, uh, changes fundamentally how these relations are imagined. Sorry, we have many comments, so I'll just I'll shut up. Okay, um, thanks so much for your talk. Um, I'm wondering how your, your genealogical critique of immunity what it has to say about uh, sort of the politics and production of scale. Mm. 
I mean, I, I find that these, uh, well, the problematic of immunology or, mm -hmm. you know, the slaughter Dickian mm -hmm. theorology really mm -hmm. lends itself to this kind of often dizzying topological collapse of scales, right? We're talking about the sphere of the globe in relation to the sphere of the body and the nation state yeah. you know, container and volumetrics. And, you know, the list goes on and on and on. Um, and you can throw whatever you want into it. Um, but I'm wondering what that sort of reveals about, and I think this is in your talk, but what it reveals about the workings of one model of sovereignty and the extent mm -hmm. to which a European model of sovereignty really relies on the organization, reorganization, constant management of scales, you know, the, and, and how these are not necessarily modern, mm -hmm. how often these are rooted in very uh, pre modern cosmologies, cosmographies mm -hmm. that map, you know, the body to the city, to mm -hmm. the spheres, and whatnot. And I'm wondering how um, your intervention and the Mongolian context in particular might help, you know, challenge this picture mm -hmm. um, and how, you know, rethinking scale along with sovereignty might factor into these, these larger mm -hmm. discussions around, you know, the stakes of co-immunism? Slaughter Dyke says co-hyphen, co-immunism, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And communism. I mean, I think yeah. uh, Slaughter Dyke, I mean, he doesn't necessarily flatten space or time so much as scale. I mean, with fo this is where he's going with phones, I think. I mean, there is sort of this flattening effect. And, and to what extent do we want to hold on to this kind of scalar verticality or differentiation? I don't know. It's an yeah, open question. Great question. Um, so uh, just a few things about that, right? Like in the parts where Sloterdijk is defending the nation state, one of the arguments that he makes is that it, it, it is that the nation state operates as the kind of largest possible scale for, you know, I guess the, from her, her like imagined community, like within the, the kind of contemporary conditions. And so his critique, right, he borrows from Schmidt um, and his critique of liberalism. And then his critique of communism is that they are fundamentally abstract, ethereal, like they break the, they, they kind of break the scale, right? There's no proletarian, there's no liberal human sub, there's no liberal humanism, there's no proletarian, you know, internationalism. Like these concepts um, reach a level of abstraction where they go beyond the ability to actually maintain and hold together identifications, right? So they kind of, he actually says somewhere, we're criticizing both liberalism and communism, that they're poorly formatted immune designs. <laughs> so, you know, in his own kind of language, but, but that, so this idea of immunity and identity, right, um, makes the, like, it makes them, kind of fits together at the scale of the nation and you try to scale up and it, and it, and it falls apart, um, which is one thing. But like, ultimately, I want to say that the end of the Svaran trilogy is truly, um, it is politically disastrous, right? So with this concept, like he, he and, and that, and then in other, uh, like uh, the world interior of capital, right? He ultimately, actually ends this trilogy, right, of several thousand pages where he says, uh, what philosophy ought to do is alleviate the guilt of people living in affluence. That's, that's, that's how he ends this, as you said, this kind of spatially diz dizzying trilogy of saying that there is nothing we can do about the fact that three quarters of the world's population live outside of these pampered affluent interiors. So if you're thinking in terms of the spatial topographical logic, like how any, you know, how do you expand the interior to encompass or do you, what do you do? And, and Slaughterdike says communism was the attempt, was the last kind of attempt to build a full spherical like encompassing of the entire world. And it created disaster. And we can't ever try it again, right? To to demolish 
all of these artificial spheres and containers of the nation states and other things and to go beyond them. Um, and, and so Sloterdijk at the end of, you know, his, at the end of his magnum opus basically says like, we can't feel guilty anymore and we need to embrace the levity of, of our lives and affluence. That, that's, that's literally the point of his thought. And, you know, to the extent where Rassier, I think, once said, like, if Sloterdijk was once part of the critical, like, leftist school, he's completely lost. His, you know, he's completely, like, out of it. And, like, Bersani also has, like, some really wonderful passages where Bersani is super excited about Sloterdijk's writing, about bodies. Also, Sloterdijk writes a lot about placentas and all kinds of, you know. And then Bersani is like, but then he just does this thing that's really, really, really scary. And just, you know, um, but why am I uh, writing about that is because I think that um, he actually shows you the kind of, you know, limit or, or why it's necessary, I think, to have some kind of, so to answer your question about scale, I think communism is, you know, I, I, I implied that at the end but as a signifier that's open-ended, whose meaning could remain to be invented, is a legacy of thinking about being in common and the dismantling of privileges, the dismantling of intellectual versus manual labor, town versus country, different kinds of nations, right? To, to, to think, uh, like, wh who, what other body of thinking names that in that way as an object and as a kind of movement to transcend those divisions. So that's why I think Sloterdijk's co-immunism is completely um, silly, to be honest. But I, you know, uh, so the only, the only real, the only viable scale would be a kind of proletarian international. I recognize how ridiculous that sounds, but, but would be a kind of proletarian internationalism. I think. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, so I'm curious about, I mean, it seems to me that maybe the stakes are, are higher than that, though, too, mm -hmm. right? I mean, like, what I took from what you were saying about the difference between Sloterdijk and Zizek mm -hmm. had to do with um, how, maybe like how history relates to their thinking. Mm -hmm. I, I study the far right, and so... I think a lot about, you know, ideas about vitalism mm -hmm. and authenticity. You know, we've, we've already brought up like the body or the mm -hmm. race being sort of contained mm -hmm. and closed, vulnerable to like impurities mm -hmm. and, and attacks in this way. But all this, it seems to me, also describes or, or can be described as like fetishization, which mm -hmm. to me works as both like a spatial kind of concept, but also mm -hmm. uh, as a sort of shorthand for dehistoricization. Mm -hmm. And so it seems to me that part of what you were offering was that what's happened through globalization is a sort of flattening of space mm -hmm. that makes that that also sort of implicates like almost a form of like accelerationism in a certain mm -hmm. way that we sort of like that one might say well if Sloterdijk's right then maybe we've reached the point where the accelerationist thesis from the left you know I mean mm -hmm. the right is a different thing but um that maybe like we're at that point mm -hmm. but that the difference between Sloterdijk and Zizek is that rather than you know, sort of bracketing it off mm -hmm. uh, in Sloterdijk's sort of like maybe even more modernist if we're, if we're mm -hmm. talking about these sort of like regimes of thinking or something. Mm -hmm. um, Rajizek might be more interested in thinking about, you know, not just spatial uh, sort of connections, but also historical ones mm -hmm. or something like this. I, I was hoping that would end my question somehow, but there you go. Okay. I mean, I, I think, you know, Sloterdijk has actually, in the book Rage and Time, and then in some other works, he's written a lot and, and laid out his kind of diagnosis of uh, anti-communism, and in specific, like, he, he, you know, whereas he can kind of at least poetically wax eloquent about, like, seafaring colonizers in the 15th and 16th century, you know, he spares no love for Lenin whatsoever. Like he's very anti-Leninist. Uh, and, and, um, and in the chapter, I kind of, um, like it, it, okay, I, I'm, I'm sure in another chapter, I'm trying to, to work out why that's the case and why it's also a kind of limitation of his thought. 
you know, um, one interesting thing is one of Slurdyke's main terms, anthropotechnics, actually comes from the early Soviet Union in thinking about um, experiments in biology um, that could actually also transform human subjectivity, right? So Slurdyke doesn't himself um, actually in any way um, that, that I'm aware of make that connection, but he he argues at the center of his philosophy is a theory of anthropotechnics, right? The kind of like technical mediation of the different forms of the human, which is fundamentally also like a term inherited from some kind of you know early 20th century Soviet experiments. But he wants to to break any to to, to dissociate himself from any kinds of legacies with that, right? And, and what I think then he's ultimately doing is um, not, to go back to your question, right, he does in a way present this dizzying different topographical kind of maps and different, you know, of, uh, of, of, of our divisions, of, of all of these divisions. Um, he even actually says like for uh, affluence is the today's apartheid is through affluence, like in Sloterdijk's work that's in there somewhere, right? But there's nothing, there's nothing you can do about it if you, if you don't avail yourself at least somewhat of the communist kind of heritage. And so that's why then you get this very abstract like co-immunism where when he does flesh it out in some parts, he says like, it will be a global immune design. Like we will all become workers implementing global uh, a, a global immune design. What the hell does that mean, right? And what, what and what does that mean in the you know actual still living in the kind of you know material conditions set by global capitalism? This is also a break in his thinking, right? Yeah, this this is the break. This is this is more recent. This idea. So I'm looking forward to hopefully seeing more articulations of or flushing out of what this what this idea looks like. But anyway. well, is there kind of yes? We want to hear your question. Yeah. Yes. Uh, well, it's a, it's kind of a big question, but one thing to think of these mm -hmm. questions is a kind of carve out within the genealogy of communism. Yeah. I want to ask you to think about these questions also, a comparable conceptual framework in relation to the genealogy of capitalism, mm -hmm. which is also about immunity uh, and has a legal as well as a, as, as a theological genealogy. Yeah. Legal genealogy is you can't have capitalism without carving out an immunity from liability Right. for the harms that you cause. Right. For example, competitive injury. If you couldn't mm -hmm. be sued for competitive injury, you can't have a market. Mm -hmm. So Great. immunity is, first of all, the idea that we cancel your liability. You have no duty not mm -hmm. to cause harms. Mm -hmm. And then the question is whether you are still protected by the duty of others not to harm you. Mm -hmm. And uh, to that it, it, and, and, and there's a moment in the genealogy of capitalism where you get both advantages. Mm -hmm. You're protected by a duty not to be harmed, you know, not to be harmed, but you have no duty not to harm. Mm -hmm. And eventually there's a carve out of this sort of freestanding category of harm mm -hmm. that is separated from duty. And then value comes mm -hmm. from resiliency. Mm. So resiliency is an internalized resistance mm. to being harmed that is accompanied by an immunity from liability right. for the harms that you cause. And, 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 and comparable to this mm -hmm. is, 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 is the discourse that of resiliency as, an, as the source of value mm -hmm. as, 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 as a carve out value and harm as a carve out from social duty and relation your right. salvation hmm. right in other words uh, in other words the notion of immunity is directly connected to the idea that you have been saved mm. and to have been saved is 
not to be considered to have sinned because of the harms that you've caused. Mm -hmm. Right. So that you are to have you know to have been saved has an alreadiness to it. Mm -hmm. And and there's a sense in which the people you're describing in 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 Mongolia mm -hmm. are are have elements of those two dimensions. I mean, right. you know, to to have been saved mm -hmm. is to regard sin as something mimetic mm -hmm. and causing harm without mimesis mm -hmm. as not sin no. because you're already saved. And and both of those are genealogical uses of the concept of, of immunity mm -hmm. from, from originally Roman law. Right in a post-Roman legal and theological context that conjuncturally produced the market. So I'm wondering whether it's it, whether whether it would be a useful perspective on your conceptual framework to think mm -hmm. about not merely how it operates in relation to mm -hmm. communism but in relation to capitalism right. and then whether different things get carved out uh, from what would otherwise be a pre-existing social context to be managed or economized or something else. Yeah, that's, I mean, I, 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 I love the this way... This is the proposal for a new book. Max <laughs> <laughs> Weber said yes. uh, of uh, capitalism uh, and the ethic of Protestantism, but I think this is an updated version of... Yeah, the updated version of yeah. yeah, The relationship of sin and liability. Yeah. And, and salvation is not yeah. having liability for your sins. It's something that never doesn't consider the property. Yeah. Yeah, yeah no, I, I, I love that. And, and to be honest, um, you know, this is the, the trying to get a handle on this project has been difficult um, because it can keep expanding in these multiple directions and looking at it in, in, in that way, um, I think is a really powerful one. You know, another, this is not directly responding to you, but another way that I, we haven't even talked about today is through like diplomatic immunity, international relations and all of those things. And one of the, you know, especially in the, you know, East Asian context, the, um, you know, extraterritoriality as a mode of like carrying your own legal system, uh, carrying your own like immunity on your back, basically. Right. You like to harm without being right. harm. Is what carves out the category of harm to begin with as something that is not, yeah. not implicated in social relations anymore. Right. Well, yeah, the, 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 the kind of very close relation between immunity and, and impunity, right? That's exactly. what you're suggesting that, you know, you can, you uh, like extraterritoriality, right, enables the, the right to, uh, to, to harm, the right to act in a way without legal repercussions or without that so it's it's kind of it's a kind of like legal self enclosure without which there wouldn't be such a thing as harm because they would, would be mm. all implicated in, in a set of reciprocal duties wrongs mm. right right <laughs> yeah i mean it sounds like a residue residue that drops out and then becomes the topic Mm. For Foucauldian management and stuff like that. Mm. That's uh, very, very, extremely helpful. Mm. Okay. Oh, thank you yeah. all so much. This is lot. Lot. Thank you. Thank you so much, Christian. Uh, thank you. Thank you, thank you all for. Uh, your comments and questions. Yeah, thank you. See you in a couple of weeks uh, with the last of four, and uh, uh, our guest uh, will be Dale Bombage, and the talk of his own celebrity. Second. What's the talk on? Second celebrity. What? Oh, oh, I see. I, see. I, see. I, see. I got you. I got you. Do you have a speaker on Saturday? No. No? Okay. Remember it correctly. So in two weeks. We in two it. weeks, yeah. Okay. On, on Wednesday. I will send an email because uh, uh, we changed the date. Uh, okay. In the, in the flyer is a Tuesday, but uh, it's coming on Wednesday. So okay. I will send an email. And we'll correct. All right. Nice to meet you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Well, thank, you. Oh, thank you so much. Really nice. Really, really nice to see you too. Ciao. 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 Ciao.